This uh, hearing will come to order. Without objection, all members' opening statements will be made a part of the record. The chair notes that some members may have additional questions for the first and second panel of witnesses, which they may wish to submit in writing. Without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 30 days for members to submit written questions to these witnesses and to place their responses in the record. This morning, we're holding hearings on Audit the Fed, Dodd-Frank, QE3, and Federal Reserve uh, Transparency. I will yield myself uh, five minutes for uh, opening remarks. Transparency of the Fed has been an issue that I have been working on for many years, and I consider it very, very important. And we have been making some progress on this. Back in the 1970s, there was a major effort made to get more transparency of the Fed, but unfortunately, it actually backfired and gave more protection to the Fed from any inquiries made by the uh, uh, Congress. One thing I'd like to make clear is my efforts to have more transparency of the Fed isn't equated to that of wanting Congress to manage day-to-day -day operations of, the, uh, mon of monetary policy. Uh, quite frankly, I, I think uh, managing of the monetary policy should be more involved with the free market, free market of interest rates, rather than anybody believing they can manage that from a day-to-day uh, viewpoint. Frequently, it is said that the um, uh, independence of the Fed must be protected at all costs. And I usually think once there's an emphasis on independence of the Fed, it usually means the secrecy of the Fed, and it's quite a bit different. But uh, the Fed hides behind this independence, so there's no political influence. But uh, I think uh, more people now are starting to realize that uh, uh, the Fed isn't truly independent from political influence because indirectly and sometimes more directly it is uh, involved in uh, political decisions or at least uh, private and secret decisions made to serve some political interests. Uh, the Constitution is rather clear on if anybody's to have any oversight, it would be the Congress rather than the executive branch. The um, uh, ability to do this, of course, has been uh, hindered. Uh, the Congress created the Federal Reserve with the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, and therefore, obviously, the, Fed, the and, uh, obviously the Congress has something to say about it. Not only did they create the Fed, but they've changed the rules. They can, the Congress has passed laws uh, in giving instructions to the Federal Reserve, so uh, clearly the Congress has uh, responsibility of oversight uh, of, the, of the Federal Reserve. I think it's very interesting that one of the arguments for independence is that uh, we can't allow the people to know what's going on with the banks. Uh, that if, if all of a sudden we knew that uh, a bank was having a problem, uh, that this would be bad information for the people uh, to know about. And, and, in, and then that is used as an excuse to prop up uh, certain banks and make sure bailouts occur and that there's a lender of last resort and there's no uh, no confusion or otherwise no correction that might be uh, be necessary. But in, in many ways, uh, the Fed performs a function exactly opposite of what the SEC is supposed to do. The SEC is a regulator that's supposed to go in and, and, and look at the books and follow some rules so that people know what's going on uh, and get information out. But it seems like, to me at least, that the uh, Federal Reserve does uh, exactly the, the opposite. Um, the significance of monetary policy is really the overriding issue about uh, uh, the Federal Reserve and what's happened since 1913 and actually what's happening today uh, because we're in the midst of a major crisis and there are many of us who have come to the conclusion that uh, the business cycle is very much related uh, to, to monetary policy. 
So if the, poli if the business cycle is related to monetary policy, uh, this is a vital interest, uh, to, should be a vital interest to all of us. Uh, if, if we connect the two, the Federal Reserve and the business cycle, then we see that uh, recessions and depressions uh, are a result of the business cycle. First you have the boom and you have to have the correction, you have to have uh, the bust. The other important relationship of the Federal Reserve to what Congress does, and uh, too, too long it's been actually symbiotic. The, uh, the Congress has been negligent in oversight, but they've been very complacent about uh, deficits being accommodated. If the Fed was not so accommodative and would and always buy the debt and keep interest rates artificially low, there would be a lot more restraints on the Congress. But as long as Congress uh, wants to spend money and they don't want to raise taxes, that's not popular, and borrowing becomes difficult, then there's a better way from their viewpoint to do it, and that is just to allow the Fed uh, to create money out of thin air, which uh, for those of us who believe in less government is better than more government, uh, whether it's warfare or welfare, uh, we see that the Federal Reserve has a, uh, has a strong influence in allowing our government to grow. So I am very pleased to uh, uh, chair this hearing today and I'm very pleased to know that uh, uh, we are making progress. Uh, we didn't get a full audit last year, but we did get an audit uh, due, uh, coming out of the Dodd-Frank bill. We did get a lot of more information and today we're going to receive more information. As, as well as the court cases that have come about. So compared to even four years ago, uh, a lot of progress has been made in the right direction, but uh, from my viewpoint, we have a long way to go. So uh, I have uh, concluded my opening statement, and uh, do I have another member would like to have an opening statement? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we'll then uh, go ahead and, and uh, start with our first panel. First panel is uh, uh, Ms. Oris Williams Brown, who has spent her 21 year career in civil service at the uh, GAO office. She is currently the managing director of GAO's financial markets and community investment team. Her portfolio of work includes banking, securities, futures, and insurance issues. Most recently, she has been responsible for leading much of GAO's work on the financial crisis, Treasury's Troubled Asset Relief Program, the Federal Reserve System and its emergency lending programs, and regulatory reform. Ms. Brown received her MBA with a concentration in finance uh, from Virginia Tech. And I, uh, and I will uh, recognize Ms. Brown for her testimony. Thank you. Chairman Paul, ranking members of the subcommittee, I am pleased to be here today to discuss our re recent report on the Federal Reserve's emergency programs. As you well know, this study was required by the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. It is the first comprehensive assessment of the Federal Reserve's use of its emergency authorities under Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act in response to the recent financial crisis. It also covers a number of programs that were carried out under Sections 10B and 14. This morning, I would like to briefly highlight a few of our findings. First, we found that the Federal Reserve and its emergency programs were subject to a number of internal and external audits. None of these audits found material weaknesses, and when issues were uncovered, the reserve banks generally addressed the deficiency in a timely manner. However, we did find that some operational audits had not been completed until the emergency programs had been operational for over a year. Second, the New York Fed was the primary player in executing most of the emergency programs authorized by the Board of Governors and the Open Market Committee. However, one program, the Term Auction Facility, was executed across all 12 Federal Reserve Banks through their discount window operations. To implement and operate the various programs, the New York Fed used over 100 vendors to provide a variety of services, ranging from legal services to asset management. 
We found that most of the contracts were awarded non-competitively and they were not recompeted after the period of exigency had passed. For a significant portion of vendor fees, reserve banks were reimbursed by program recipients or fees paid from program income. Third, we found that while the Federal Reserve took steps to manage conflicts of interest, opportunities exist to strengthen its policies for employees, directors, and vendors. During the crisis, the New York Fed expanded its guidance and monitoring for employee conflicts. However, while the crisis highlighted the potential for reserve banks to provide emergency assistance to a broad range of institutions, the New York Fed had not yet revised its conflict policies and procedures to more fully reflect potential conflicts that could arise with this new expanded role. Fourth, we looked at the Federal Reserve's risk management practices. We found that it took steps to mitigate the risk of loss, such as requiring collateral amounts beyond the loan exposure for the early programs and accepting only highly rated assets as collateral for some of the latter, more novel programs. For actions to assist individual institutions, it negotiated specific protections. Over time, the New York Fed expanded its rich risk management capabilities and started to manage risks across all programs. However, we found that neither the Reserve Bank nor the Board of Governors tracked total potential lost exposures across all emergency programs. Finally, we found that while the Board of Governors took steps to promote consistent treatment of participants, it lacked guidance and documentation for some decisions. For example, Reserve Banks lack documented procedures to guide decisions about restricting or denying access to the programs. We made seven recommendations to the Board of Governors to strengthen policies for managing non-competitive vendor selections, conflicts of interest, risks related to emergency lending, and documentation of emergency program decisions. In response, the Reserve Board indicated that it recognized the benefits and would strongly consider how best to respond. In closing, I would also note that many of these programs were established during the height of the financial crisis and little public information was provided. Over time, the Board of Governors and New York Fed increased the amount of information provided to the public and going forward, the Dodd-Frank Act requires even greater transparency and accountability for any future actions. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, this concludes my oral statement, and I would be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will yield five minutes to myself for uh, questions. Overall, having done this audit and been involved was there any one thing that you uh, were more frustrated with? Or was there any obstacles or misunderstanding or the law was confusing? Or was this a pretty uh, clear-cut responsibility and uh, there weren't that many problems? How do, you, how do you look at it in general? In general, I would say that the um, act laid out a pretty clear level of expectation for us in terms of what was expected, the programs that we were to cover, and exactly what aspect of the program and the operations of the programs that we were supposed to cover. So I would say it was fairly straightforward. Okay, and this was a one-year audit. You just have to perform this one time. Correct. Now, uh, would, would there be much of a problem if, uh, if we were doing this every year uh, as, as far as ac accomplishing what you've, we've, you've done? Is this, uh, what kind of a task is this? Well, this particular audit, while it was fairly straightforward, it was um, an enormous undertaking given the number of emergency programs involved as well as the other programs that were specifically delineated. Um, you know, going forward, if one, we'd have to keep in mind kind of the current um, structure that we have around our authority to perform audits. As you know, Dodd-Frank includes in Section 1102 some additional authority for us to look at any future credit facilities that the Fed may establish and also certain um, open market or monetary policy activities that are delineated in, in the Dodd-Frank Act. So if we were asked to do those, we would, you know, look at any particular request in turn and approach it 
very much the way we approach this. And, and from your own experience, uh, you've not had to look into the Federal Reserve in the way you did this time. Is this uh, something rather unique for your experience? Yes. Uh, many say that it is unnecessary to audit the Fed because they are already audited annually by an independent auditor. These audits are of the Fed's financial statements and became a legal requirement just in the late 1990s. Can you describe to us the difference between these financial audits that they'd like to say, well, they're all inclusive and we know everything, versus an audit conducted by the GAO? Could you describe the difference uh, between the two? Yes. Um, GAO actually also does financial audits, but we do uh, performance evaluations. And the audit that we did in, um, and issued in July of 2011 falls under the um, program evaluation performance audit arena. And the biggest difference is that we in this were asked to look at specific operational um, issues. We were asked to look at the operational integrity um, issues like internal controls over the operations of the programs. We were also asked to look at how the programs were implemented and stood up. Financial audits tend to focus on if um, whether or not the financial statements are being fairly and accurately presented and the controls around the financial reporting. So it's, it, it tends to be um, kind of much broader and also more in-depth. Along that line, I want to follow up with uh, a similar question. The Dodd-Frank GAO audit has been described as a procedural audit. It seems that most of the analysis was looking at the protocol and guidelines in place for the various emergency lending facilities. What do we know about individual transactions? How were they conducted? How collateral was evaluated? And all, uh, who, who all had knowledge and access to the facilities and, and in those things in general. Are they included in the GAO's audit or were they not part of the directives uh, given by the uh, Dodd-Frank, uh, especially on the individual transactions and who knew about them and, and why they occurred? Well, we were specifically asked to look at the, the operational aspects of the program, but that include looking at certain individual transactions, um, specifically when it came to assistance to individual institutions. Um, but in terms of looking at the broad-based programs, we did look at eligibility requirements. We looked at um, who the largest users were of the particular programs, and we also looked at how the decision uh, was made from the perspective of, you know, who approved the particular emergency program. Was it the Board of Governors? Was it the um, Open Market Committee? And then how the particular Reserve Bank implemented the action that had been authorized by the Board of Governors or the um, FOMC. Thank you. And my five minutes has expired, so we'll move on uh, to the uh, next member. And this is uh, the gentleman from Missouri, Blaine Luca Maurer. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, one of the things that's kind of concerning to me is the fact that um, all banks, credit unions, uh, thrifts, what have you, are all, they have some entity that uh, provides oversight over them. And yet the Fed, which is the central bank, basically, I guess you would say, of our country, has very little, if any, oversight over it. Um, you know, in the, some of the things that you say here, the things that were not, because of the, the prohib prohibitions you were not able to go into, I think it's kind of uh, interesting. Where, where do you think we need to draw the line on this? GAO's position is that, you know, this is a policy decision and wherever the line is drawn and the bar is set for us to do whatever action, we will do what Congress asks us to do. Okay. Along the line, with regards to the emergency loans um, that were done during the height of the situation we had in this country, uh, you say in here that Federal Reserve Banks required borrowers under several programs to post collateral in excess of a loan amount, programs that did not require uh, pledge assets with high ratings, et cetera, et cetera. Did you see in the way that they handled the, uh, the loans, was it in normal banking terms? In other words, did they, did they have the normal sort of uh, requirements for collateral excess over the loan they made, normal repayment terms, or what did you see there? 
We, we did look at the um, security and collateral procedures around loans that were made, and we, f we evaluated the process that they had in place. And um, we found that they did have um, you know, controls around those, that they did have requirements that certain loans be over collateralized. And in other cases, there was a requirement that the collateral posted um, be um, highly rated. So there were certain controls that were built around the loans that were did being made. Any, did you see anything there that was of concern to you? Um, we didn't see anything that, that raised a, a major concern. We did point out that some of the uh, internal audits that had been done had raised um, some questions around increasing the, the controls around the collateral, and we did look at the extent to which those had been addressed. And we found that at some point, you know, when an issue was raised, the bank would take steps to improve the controls that, um, that were in place. Have all these loans been paid back? Um, for many of the broad programs, they have been. There are outstanding loans for the three um, Maiden Lane LLCs uh, related to the assistance to Bear Stearns and AIG. Um, okay, the point I'm going to try to get to here, though, is they haven't all been paid back. Yet correct. Your, your audit uh, authority is over with. Is that correct? Correct. So therefore, at this point, there is no audit authority on those loans that have been paid subsequent to your, to your audit or those that are yet to be paid. Is that correct? For, in all cases except for any that involved um, assistance to individual institutions. Okay, do you think it'd be a good idea if we went back and had a requirement to audit those after, uh, whenever they're all paid off to see once everything was done according to sound financial tenants? Um, it's, it's something that if we were asked to do, we would definitely do That's that. That's a policy decision, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, with regards to uh, the open market operations of the Fed, uh, one of the things that says here is that you are, they are not required to disclose their operations until two years after they take place. Um, how, do you, how do you get a hold of uh, information that's... Uh, um, uh, pertinent, that's, uh, that's time sensitive, that can, we can actually get a good job of seeing what everything's going on here. If you can't do it within a, a two-year time frame, that seems almost uh, beyond the ability to sort of implement any sort of controls or, or corrections. Well, we, we would note that in the audit that we did that was issued in July, um, it was done in many cases less than a two-year time period. Okay, I got one more question real quickly. With regards to the uh, the, the swap lines of things that they have with foreign banks. Mm -hmm. Were you able to do anything at all with, with uh, oversight over that? Were you able to look into any of the, the, the uh, activities along those lines? We did. That was one of the specific programs um, listed under our authority in Dodd-Frank. Uh, we basically looked at how they were structured. We found um, that the Fed had engaged in a number of swap line transactions with, with foreign central banks. And um, the biggest takeaway was that once the, the Fed engaged in the swap with the foreign central bank, any activity of the central bank, um, the foreign central bank, was really, um, from the Fed's perspective, that was the central bank's responsibility, and the, the foreign central bank assumed any credit risk from the activities that it engaged in. Okay, if the chairman will be with one, one more question. Where, do you see any risk to the Fed with that, with that tr the way that's structured right now, the um, well, that's one program that remains open, and the authority for that program is open through August of 2012. It was one of the programs that been had been extended, and um, you know, as with swaps, um, there's you know currency risk associated with 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 currency swap type of transactions. Okay, I see my time's up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for indulging. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> now I yield five minutes <clears throat> to Congresswoman Hayworth from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for conducting this hearing. Thank you, Ms. Williams-Brown, for being with us. Um, I, there's a notable statement in the GAO report that some Federal Reserve Board decisions to extend credit to certain borrowers were not fully documented. Um, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. What sort of documentation would you like to have seen? Um, you know, was there an explanation as to why the documentation was lacking? Well, 
In, in the area of documentation, kind of prior to Dodd-Frank, there wasn't an explicit requirement for the Fed to, to document its decisions. So from an audit perspective, that often presents a challenge in determining exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. um, so that requires us to have a number of conversations with the relevant players. But what we noted is with the programs, there were generally broad eligibility requirements and institutions that were generally considered to be in good financial condition were, a, were um, able to participate in a particular program. Um, but to the extent that there were exceptions that didn't necessarily um, appear to, to coincide with the particular um, process in place, um, we had to have conversations to find out kind of why things happen. One example is with the um, commercial paper lending facility, an AIG subsidiary was allowed to participate in, um, to continue to participate in the facility, even though they no longer met the, the new requirements, and that is that they had been an active participant in the commercial paper market, but they were still allowed to participate in the, fa the facility. Uh, is there further work ongoing to determine why that was allowed to occur or? No. So that now lies with uh, us, I guess, here too. Yeah. And we did make a recommendation to the Fed kind of g going forward that if they were to engage in credit facilities or any emergency um, lending in the future, that it's important to um, document decisions, and the Dodd-Frank Act now has a reporting requirement, so we pointed out that in order to fulfill that reporting requirement in the future, there's documentation that has to go along with the decision making. In order to uh, report encourage, it. And, yeah. and presumably to encourage sound decision making. Yes. So that we're not doing things that, that don't make sense fiscally. That, yes, that and to be able to then report to the Congress, you know, what was being done and why. All right. Well, thank you, Ms. Williams-Brown. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the remainder of my time. And I, <clears throat> I now yield five minutes to the Congressman from Arizona, Mr. Schweikert. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it's uh, Ms. Williams-Brown. Um, uh, part of this is actually, and my good friend from New York was almost touching on parts of this, um, first, on, on the emergency facilities, mm -hmm. were you able to take a look at how well documented um, the requests were? Um, the, 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 the systemization of the decision making. And, and part of where I'm leading on this is just sort of your opinion you know, when you're playing auditor. Um, if we were to have a, another hiccup, do they have mechanical rules and, and steps that, that are consistent? Um, what did you see? Well, well, at the retrospective audit, there weren't requirements for them to document um, specific decision um, points. So from that perspective, it required us to go back and attempt to reconstruct how decisions were made. The going forward, there, there are new requirements um, in terms of being able to report out that um, should help provide some additional structure around it, and that's one of the things that we also spoke to in some of our recommendations. Um, I, I've heard some discussions about, uh, even before, of some of the new requirements, um, but do they seem to now have been adopted in sort of the, if you and I were to lay out a flow chart of saying, here's our decision-making process, I, with you and I also understanding, this may be a process that sometimes has to be done very quickly. Correct. Um, but it also helps to know what, check boxes you're going through saying, okay, we have this, we have this, we have this, and we, it, from what you're seeing, have those documentation requirements, the new ones, been built into the system? Well, I will say since July, we haven't gone back to um, update the status of the recommendations that we made, so I can't say if they have addressed the recommendations that we made, for example, for a better documentation process. So that's not something I'm in a position today to say that they have or have not done those types of things. Okay, um, Mr. Chairman, Ms. William Brown, um, with that, because where I'm sort of hunting is how did they document what assets were being pledged, uh, future forward, um, what was being swapped, and, and, and how well that was sort of locked in saying, 
yes, you're pledging this, and when, once you've pledged it, you can't go and touch it anywhere else. And we also have a proper mechanics telling us any exposure, like are there any sort of uh, what, where these assets may have also lent out their um, value to, to okay. other pledges. I, I'm just I'm trying to understand the decision tree, but also the quality of the documentation on assets pledged. Now, in terms of um, kind of pledging collateral and tracking that, we did look at the control process around the, the collateral process. And we did specific drill downs on two of the facilities that um, that borrowers were able to pledge a wide variety of collateral for a single loan. And we did a drill down to look at the collateral that was pledged, and we also did some independent um, evaluation and testing to make sure that those controls around those were operational. So there was a process around that. When you were looking at, at some of that, did you find some of the assets didn't really ultimately the market value add up to what they were put into in the pledge? We, well, we looked at really kind of the pricing of the collateral and we found in a small percent of cases, somewhere around 2%, that there was some uh, discrepancy in the, the price of the particular cat, the um, collateral that we tracked versus what was included in the data that we had gotten from the Federal Reserve but we did not find any type of systematic bias one way or the other in terms of how that um, collateral had been priced. But, but only about 2%. It was a fairly small percentage, outlets. yes. <clears throat> I'm surprised. And would, would some of that have been MBS? Uh, Mortgage-backed securities? Right. Because of the you know, way you would price it? I think it, was, it cut across a variety of the types of collateral that had been posted. Um, last one, and, and I'm partially doing this from writing and see if I find it in my notes, uh, and this one may be almost asking more of an opinion. Um, Inspector General for the Fed, uh, I think, has also been given additional duties to um, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. So they're <laughs> almost wearing two hats, um, even though they're now separated. Um, any opinion on does that mechanically work? That's not something we've specifically looked at. So I'm not in a position to offer an opinion. No, gosh darn on that one. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, yield back my time. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. I yield five minutes now to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heitzinka. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, uh, I just want to appreciate uh, or want to express my appreciation for you uh, holding this hearing. I think this is very important. I appreciate your time uh, coming in as well. And, and I won't plan on using this uh, full five minutes, but I, I am struck by the theme that we're hearing of um, uh, a need for oversight. And uh, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's certainly uh, sort of the tone that I'm, that I'm catching, that this is uh, a good thing that we, uh, that we should, uh, or that has happened. I think it's up to us then to decide whether this is something that we should continue. It seems to me we should. I am curious a bit about if you could unpack, and I apologize if you had uh, had to step out for a, a phone call, but maybe you touched on this, but I um, wonder if you could unpack a little bit about what some of the lending uh, facilities were used by, by branches and subsidiaries of foreign banks, and, uh, and were you really able to determine why several of those emergency lending facilities were primarily used by foreign institutions? And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, we did look at the largest um, users across the facilities, and we did find that there are certain facilities that tended to be used um, by the, the branches and agencies of foreign banks. And in conversations and following up with uh, the Federal Reserve about the reason for that, um, we found that usually the largest lenders of facilities were driven by kind of the composition of the market. Um, so if it's a market that there were major, um, major foreign banks that had branches and agencies in the U.S., they would have been as likely as a, a U.S. bank to, um, to tap a particular facility. And so that wasn't necessarily a, a region when you're when you're saying that it could be a product line uh, or 
product line or a particular um, market that they were active in because many of the broad-based programs were aimed at a particular um, disruption that was going on in a particular market. Um, commercial paper, um, some of the money market um, mutual funds had also experienced problems. And, so. and could you characterize sort of the ratio of uh, domestic versus the foreign? It really varies by program. And I'd be more than happy to um, you know, provide a, br a breakdown for each facility for the record. That would be great. How many facilities, as you're using the term facility, how many facilities are there? How many breakdowns do you think that would be? Out of 10, 11 facilities? There were, there were, I think it was somewhere in kind of the 10 to 12 range. Okay. Um, right. Uh, we appreciate the follow up on that. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. We yield back. Uh, thank you. And now I yield uh, additional time for a follow-up question to uh, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to, like to follow up just a little bit more on the uh, swap line discussion we had a minute ago. Um, can you tell me how many times the, the line has been used, or is it just beyond just you know, number of times per day, or, or has it just been only three or four times in the last six or eight months? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that we tracked it by the number of times used, but we focused on the number of foreign central banks that were permitted to participate in the swap line. And there it would have been through um, the July time frame. And how, do you have an idea of how many times that was? I don't. We had the chairman in here not too long ago, and he indicated that there was almost zero activity. Well, I will say that when we issued our report as of the end of June, the balance on the swap lines was zero okay. at that time. So okay. they looking, had been used and, looking, and repaid. And looking at those transactions, did you, did you see any, anything in there that would pose a risk to the Fed or therefore our taxpayers? I think it, the, the potential for, because the Fed would be swapping dollars for a foreign cor currency with an agreement that the foreign central bank would, um, would reverse the swap at the same rate that the other, to the extent that rates it move, there's, there's a potential risk built into. Okay, did you see where the, it's a pass through from other existing banks over in Europe through the central bank there, or was it just a direct swap through the European central bank? Well, it was, once the swap happened with the particular central bank that the Fed engaged in the swap activity with, um, the Federal Reserve didn't track what happened to those dollars once they were in the hands of the foreign um, okay, central Okay, so bank. basically there's basically there a firewall then between the transaction and wherever else those monies would go to, those other dollars would flow to. Is that, right. is that, a, is that a fair statement? Um, I guess I'm pausing on the firewall, but there, there is definitely well, I mean, a separation. Okay, there, yes. there's, there's, no, there's no tangible liability exposure to us from one of the other banks in Europe that's going to be passed through the European Central Bank. I guess that's a better way to phrase right. the question. Right. The Central Bank would, would assume that risk. Okay. So there basically then is no other risk that we've assumed, the Fed's assumed, from those activities. Right. Beyond the swap. Okay. And the only risk that you see there is just the normal currency activity uh, of, the, of the daily ups and downs of the of the, the value of the currency itself, or is there other other things in the transaction? That well, worry? there could potentially be others, but that was the one that kind of immediately comes that, to mind. That's the biggest risk. Um, I would say that that's the one that immediately comes to mind for okay. me. And I All do right. have a total on the number of transactions, okay. um, 569. Um, those were that's how many transactions there were. Between what time for it? Um, this would have been from the beginning of the program through uh, June 29, 2011. Really? Okay. Uh, one more quick question. Uh, in, your, in your report, you indicate that there is, uh, the GO found that conflict of interest policies could be strengthened. Can you give an example of where there's a conflict of interest that you found that there's a problem or exposure or concern? Well, we, we found a number that raised um, issues. They raised an appearance of a conflict, um, and one had to do with uh, senior Federal Reserve Bank of New York officials 
ha they held stock um, in some of the institutions that had received assistance. AIG was one example. Did you see a, a pattern with individuals or with particular companies, particular entities like through AIG or other uh, companies or other entities that were out there that they were trying to work with? Or I wouldn't say we observed any type of um, pattern. We observed with the vendors that there were situations that the, that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, for example, could have taken additional steps to strengthen their, um, their management of conflicts of interest that may have exi existed within vendors. Um, and done additional oversight of what the vendors were actually doing to make sure that they weren't exposed to conflicts. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the second, second round. Uh, thank you, and I now yield uh, for follow-up question to Mr. Schweikert from Arizona. And, and forgive me, um, I just want to make sure I was listening carefully um, to Congressman Lukemeyer. Um, on uh, facilities that uh, were with foreign central banks, um, uh, was there a currency risk on when the um, assets were moved back? Well, that, that issue really comes up on the, the dollar swap lines because that's actually a swap of um, U.S. dollars for current foreign currency with the agreement to reverse the swap. Um, it, it, would yeah. be, it would be an unusual instrument to unwind it back to, you know, the the value of the previous swap if there had been movement in the currencies. That sort of defeats the purpose of it. Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of the nature of a swap um, that you agree to exchange the currency and reverse it at a particular price at a particular date in the future. Okay. So, so there, there was, from what you were seeing is there was always a pledge on um, the, the value at the end? Uh, For the dollar swap lines. Only. Yeah, no, that right. was the only one I was interested in. Mm -hmm. um, second of all, um, and I know this is a little on the annoying side, but um, if you would uh, have one of your staff reach out to our office sometime in the mm -hmm. next couple of weeks, we'd love sort of in writing to be able to chase down, um, as you were saying, that it was 2% that you saw that, uh, of pledged assets that you thought sort of may have been outliers. Um, and it, this is one of those occasions I have to go through my file cabinet and find an article from couple months ago mm -hmm. that I think was talking about specifically um, um, private label MBS that may have been pledged that may have been much further um, uh, in a dispute of what its true value was. And I'm just trying to get my head around having sort of read one thing and now in testimony making sure I'm using the same definitions there. Well, and it's not only an issue of the same definitions, but this is something that could vary from facility to facility. Oh, yeah. And my comment was specific to two credit facilities, but you know it, this could actually be the case in one of the others. In, so, it it right. absolutely would be that way. Yeah. I mean, it would absolutely be that way. Um, and if there was 500 some different ones, as I think I just heard you say, um, for the transactions for the dollar swap lines. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That, um, last one is also as long as we're asking you to throw something uh, into notes, um, uh, so that. Uh, Inspector General, um, comment before. I know this really isn't your area, but I'd love someone, if, if, there, if you know if there's a policy statement or somewhere um, at, in the agency in regards whether this really works to have one Inspector General sort of doing both the consumer um, finance protection and the Fed, even though they now wear very se sort of separate hats. Um, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, does anybody else care for any follow-up questions? If not, um, I, I want to thank the witness for appearing, and also, without objection, your written statement will be made right. part of the record, and you are now dismissed, and pan the second panel may come to the table. Thank you.
We will now uh, receive testimony from our second panel. Um, our first panelist, Dr. Robert Arbach, is Professor of Public Affairs at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas in Austin. He was an economist with the House of Representatives Financial Services Committee, formerly the Banking and Finance and Urban Affairs, for 11 years. He assisted Chairman Henry Royce in the 70s and the 80s and Chairman Henry Gonzalez in the 90s with oversight of the Fed, spanning four Fed chairmen, Burns, Miller, Volcker, and Greenspan. He is the author of the book, Deception and Abuse at the Fed. He received two master's degrees in economics, one from the University of Chicago and one from Roosevelt University under Abba Lerner. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Chicago, where he studied under Milton Friedman. Our second panelist is Dr. Mark Calabria, who is the Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute. Prior to joining Cato in 2009, he spent seven years as a member of the senior professional staff of the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, where he handled issues relating to housing, mortgage finance, economics, banking, and insurance. Dr. Calabria has served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Regulatory Affairs at the Department of Housing and Urban Development and has been a research associate with the U.S. Census Bureau's Center for Economic Studies. He is a frequent contributor to the New York Post, National Review, and Investors Business Daily and frequently appears on CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business, BBC, and BNN. He received his Ph.D. in economics from George Mason uh, University. I would like to uh, now uh, recognize this second panel and also uh, under uh, unanimous consent, your written testimony will be uh, placed in the record. So I recognize uh, Mr. Arbaugh, Dr. Arbaugh. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, Chairman Ron Paul and the members of this committee. I'm honored to come back here where I worked for 11 years. Uh, one thing you left out, I also worked in the Reagan administration saying the same things in between the periods I worked here at the Treasury Department. Uh, I want to talk about the transparency at the Fed. The Fed is the powerful central bank of the United States that controls the money supply, regulates the banking system, and since 1962 makes loans to foreign banks without congressional authorization. The historical record of Federal Reserve officials blocking transparency and individual accountability, including destroying source records of its policy-making committee since 1995 mm -hmm. is clear. I want to especially thank uh, Chairman Ron Paul and Senator Bernie Sanders for finally getting some kind of an audit at the Federal Reserve in the Dodd-Frank Act. In 1976, when I was here, I assisted Henry Royce in putting up a, an audit bill of the Fed. The Fed immediately amounted, mounted a huge lobbying campaign using the bankers that it regulates to come to Washington and go into all the offices here and stop the audit. Uh, Chairman Royce went to the floor of the House later when we got direct evidence of how the Fed you, uh, use their offices and their facilities to organize the bankers they regulate to come to the Congress and lobby. Finally, the bill was uh, a couple of years later, 1978, was passed down the hall at uh, the Government Operations Committee with two glaring no audit parts of the bill. One is anything to do with monetary policy or international transactions at the Fed. Um, let me just talk one mo moment about those two areas. In the monetary policy area, there are tremendous opportunities to make billions of dollars on inside information from the many leaks 
of Fed monetary policy, which I helped in the committee investigate for, for many years. You can, let me just give you one little taste of it. First of all, Greenspan said, after a number of leaks when the newspapers were publishing what they had said the previous day in their secret meetings, that were beginning to look like a bunch of buffoons. They had at those secret meetings at the Kansas City Fed, where I used to work, uh, central bankers from Bulgaria, China, Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Romania, and Russia attending and listening to interest rate uh, information that they would not give the Congress at that time. In, um, Finally, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, decided that they would not like to have any more minutes public of their central policy making committee. That was Arthur Burns in 1976 from a, a law then that was being passed, Government in the Sunshine Law and a suit from a student uh, at a university in Washington, D.C. So the Fed voted then, 1976, 10 to 1 vote, that they would no longer have any transcripts of their central policy-making committee. And it's a 10 to 1 vote, and the 17-year lie began. Uh, Finally, in 1992, I came back for the second time and I spoke with the great Henry B., as they call him in his district in San Antonio. How could it be that the most powerful central bank in the world had no transcripts of its meetings that they used to send out? What happened to them? So uh, Mr. Gonzalez had all the Fed presidents come, all but two showed up, Greenspan sat in the middle, right where I'm sitting, members of the Board of Governors on each side, and they misled the Congress. Um, we put a lot of heat on them because they were federal witnesses, and a few days later, the Cleveland Fed broke and said, well, they had had a meeting four days earlier where they des decided how they'd mislead the Congress. And, um, I just have uh, it, one, one uh, person at that meeting, the staff person, a very good staff person who used to work with me at the uh, Kansas City Fed, but he was assisting Greenspan, said the chairman is not highlighting these transcripts. We're not waving red flags. And when Congressman Morris Hinchy had asked him at the hearing right here, do you have any records? And he said just, just some notes we keep. Um, well, after that, uh, Greenspan sent a letter over here and said, well, actually, this is 17 years later. Uh, we have those transcripts. And I took a group of Republican and Democratic staffers over to the Board of Governors, found them right around the corner from Greenspan's office, neatly typed. And uh, so they decided then that they'd start issuing the transcripts again after a five-year lag, much too long for timely accountability. And th after I left the committee, went down to Texas, I read that they had decided in 1995 to shred the records of the Federal Open Market Committee. They had been kept, those transcripts had been kept and sent to the National Archives, but they decided to destroy them. So I wrote a letter to Alan Greenspan asking why they're doing that, and his vice chairman, very good person inside the Fed, these are good people, they just have bad policies. Uh, D Donald Cohn, who's a, worked there for many years and became vice chairman, started at the Kansas City Fed, he wrote to me, yes, we've decided to destroy the, the transcripts of our meetings, but we think it's legal. Um, uh, 
I just want to go through a few other things on the audits so you can get an idea of how bad the audits have been of the Fed. Just two little points. One is the Los Angeles branch of the Kansas City Fed. You can ask me questions about it. When we found out that the auditing system there was corrupt, and I took an excellent GO, GAO team, I was a liaison, went in there and found that the system was completely corrupt. And Greenspan admitted in a letter to the committee that they knew that the employees of the Fed had stolen at least $500,000 in the previous 10 years from the vault system of the 12 banks. And one other thing, and then I'll quit. <laughs> the airplane fleet of the Fed, 50 plus airplanes. The audit there was a joke. There was no audit. The, the, the people running the fleet in Boston used to laugh about it. And they appeared here. Uh, uh, Mr. Castle allowed them to come, and they were very courageous. And they talked about it right in the committee room here. And uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, K uh, Carolyn Maloney, Congressman Maloney, helped in, in investigating them. That was, no, that was a completely corrupted thing. It was typified by their backup plane, the Fed paid for in Teterboro Airport, that didn't exist most of the time. Now, what, that's all I want to say. If you, I have two other points. One is about paying off all the economists throughout academia, an investigation of Henry B. Gonzalez, and what I consider malpractice, the, pres the present policy, monetary policy of the Fed that was begun in October 2008 that's caused a lot of unemployment in the United States. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Dr. Calabria now. Uh. Chair Chairman Paul, distinguished members of the subcommittee, I thank you for the invitation to appear at today's important hearing. As the subcommittee is well aware, the events of 2008 witnessed not only unprecedented disruptions to our financial markets, but also extraordinary responses on the part of our financial regulators and central bank. No entity was more deeply involved in the Federal Reserve System, particularly the New York Federal Reserve. Yet the Fed has consistently and repeatedly resisted efforts to bring accountability and transparency to its actions. Congress and the public were repeatedly warned that if details of the Fed's actions became public, further panic would ensue in our financial markets. Yet when, when, yet when that information, such as AIG's derivatives counterparties, finally did become public, disruptions were minimal or non-existent. Despite some notable attempts by the Fed to increase its communications with the public, I believe given its track record, the public cannot rely on the Fed to voluntarily provide us with sufficient information to monitor activities uh, and judge the effectiveness of its actions. And while the requirements of the Dodd-Frank Act in relation to auditing the Fed's activities are an important advance, they far fall too short of providing sufficient oversight of the Federal Reserve. What auditing has been conducted so far has been focused on the Fed's response to the crisis. Uh, accordingly, much of the audit requirements in Dodd-Frank have something of an historical feel about them. However, it is not enough just to get history right, although we're lucky if we do that, but also to ensure that future mistakes are avoided. Uh, I can think of few areas requiring as much mistake avoidance as monetary policy. The Fed's role in helping to create the crisis via its easy money policies in the aftermath of the dot-com bubble and the events of 9-11 remain largely uninvestigated by Congress. Uh, if we truly wish to end financial crises, then I believe it's absolutely essential that Congress receive a full and objective evaluation of the Fed's role in fostering the housing bubble, particularly as it relates to monetary policy decisions between 2002 and 2005. Uh, disagreement as to the appropriate stance of current monetary policy, I think, also demonstrates Congress, Congress's need for objective, independent analysis of monetary policy. Some might object that a GAO audit of the Fed subjects the Fed to political pressure. I think that such an objection ignores the simple fact that GAO is not a political organization. Uh, as mentioned, I served as staff on the Banking Committee for a number of years. I can say through all of my interactions with the GAO, they are independent, they are unbiased, they are non-political. Uh, I have not always agreed with the conclusions of GAO, but I have never felt that any of those agree disagreements uh, were the result of politics or bias. Uh, I think the subcommittee should also keep in mind that GAO exists for a very simple reason. 
that no member of Congress or their staff are fully knowledgeable about the functioning of all the various government agencies. GAO simply exists to inform. Uh, I would argue that there are few areas less understood than monetary policy and macroeconomics. Hence, I would argue there are few areas more in need of an audit than monetary policy and, and macroeconomics. Uh, again, the purpose of GAO here is to try to provide some information so that members can more actively engage, uh, I think, and more effectively engage in oversight of the Federal Reserve. Uh, another objection to a GAO audit of the Fed is that such would compromise the Fed's independence and subject it to political influence. Uh, I think such an objection confuses the very nature of Fed independence. The Fed's authority to regulate the value of money is one that is delegated from Congress. As Congress can and has legislated changes to the Fed, it should be beyond a doubt that the Fed is not independent of Congress. It is quite the opposite. It is a creature of Congress, and Congress has every right uh, in that avenue to interject and, can, and act, regulate the activities of the Fed itself. Setting aside the debate over the desirability and legitimacy of so-called independent agencies, it should be clear that their independence in any operational sense is supposed to be from the executive branch, not from Congress. Uh, it should also be clear, however, that in recent years the Federal Reserve has coordinated its, its actions quite closely with the Treasury Department, in my opinion, eroding any independence from the, from the Treasury. The revolving door, both at the political and career levels between the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department, further undermines the Fed's operational independence. Uh, I believe a GAO audit would help shine a light on this relationship, actually helping to insulate the Federal Reserve from continued interference by the Treasury Department. Again, the, the Dodd-Frank Act has made important advances in bringing transparency and accountability to the Federal Reserve. Unfortunately, it falls short in allowing Congress and the public to truly gauge the effectiveness of the Federal Reserve. Uh, in order to improve Federal Reserve transparency, I would suggest that Congress mandate a regular audit of all Federal Reserve activities, including monetary policy. Such audits could be performed in a manner sort of minimize the disruptions to any ongoing deliberations of the Federal Open Market Committee. For instance, uh, these audits could be kept confidential for a short amount of time, six months, a year. Uh, that's certainly something that could be done not to try to unduly influence ongoing activities. But again, those audits should be made public at some point. Uh, I think it's also important to emphasize evaluating the effectiveness of any government agency is made all the more difficult when that agency faces a variety of competing and sometimes conflicting objectives. If the Federal Reserve feels it's free to abandon price stability in order to achieve other objectives, such as rescuing the financial industry or misguided attempts to influence the labor market, then I believe the value of an audit may potentially be very limited. At a minimum, Congress should consider restricting the Federal Reserve to a single goal, that of price stability. Uh, Congress should also restrict the ability of the Fed to have discretion in implementing that goal. On a very basic level, a central bank that is free to define price stability to define its own objective is a central bank without any meaningful constraint. Uh, with that, again, I thank the uh, chairman, I thank the subcommittee, and I uh, look, look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. I yield myself five minutes for questioning. <clears throat> First question is for Dr. Calabria. And I want you to follow up, I know you've uh, talked about it in your uh, statement, to follow up on this relationship of the Fed and the Treasury. Um, and you indicate that uh, if there's to be any oversight or any connection, it's more with the Congress than with the executive branch and the, and the Treasury. Could, um, could, could you talk a little bit sure. more about that and exactly what, uh, what do you mean and what has happened in the past that might suggest that we should be looking into uh, the relationship of, of Treasury and the Fed and uh, how that could be a negative or why some people think it's a positive? Well, there are a variety of different things, and, and I'll, I'll touch on Maybe I will most directly touch on first the uh, negotiation and implementation of Dodd-Frank. Uh, Treasury was the point person in negotiating Dodd-Frank for the administration, yet several of these senior advisors at Treasury representing the administration were staff on loan from the Federal Reserve. Uh, so again, you know, we, I think many of us remember there was about a whole five minutes during the Dodd-Frank negotiations where maybe there really were going to be serious restraints on the Federal Reserve, where there would be a serious re, uh, examination of their bank supervision, regulatory powers. Uh, again, I, I think the Congress and GAO should take a look at whether the Fed should be supervising banks in general and whether the, that conflicts and provides any conflict of interest with their monetary policy decisions. But A, having essentially Federal Reserve staff at Treasury negotiating on behalf of the administration, certainly in my opinion, 
meant that the, there was going to be no chance that Congress was actually going to be able to peel back any of the powers of the Federal Reserve. So A, again, the Treasury relies very heavily on Federal Reserve expertise and in in legislative decision making. Most importantly, however, and it's important to keep in mind you know, that Fed independence really came out of this Treasury Fed accord where prior to the 60s, the Federal Reserve supported Treasury prices, essentially, and tried to maintain the price of long-term Treasuries in order to, so that the uh, Treasury Department could more easily and more cheaply fund its activities. Uh, and again, if you have this relationship uh, and you see this particularly with the second round of quantitative easing, where the amount that the Fed were purchasing on a monthly basis was coincidentally very close to the amount that was being issued by the Treasury. Uh, and, and so the extent that we go down that road of potentially monetizing the debt, which I think is the ultimate concern, that you have the Treasury market supported by the Federal Reserve, which of course reduces discipline on not only the Treasury, but reduces discipline on Congress to get its fiscal house in order. So again, we rely on the markets to send us signals, and the Treasury market should be sending us a signal that we're headed to a financial train wreck, but it's of course not because the Federal Reserve is intervening in that market to reduce the price signal that we'd be receiving. So that's an important part of the debt market, I think is ultimately one of the more important aspects of this. Uh, but again, you also see it in financial regulation. Uh, in, I want to emphasize again, the nature of independence is supposed to be not from Congress, but from the executive branch. There is a variety of literature, for instance, in economics that talks about a political business cycle where you would see the Federal Reserve try to loosen monetary policy in expectation of uh, presidential elections. Again, I, I would say that the empirical results in this literature are mixed, but again, the emphasis is on the administration. We know that in terms of any president's reelection, it's going to be far more important what the Fed does compared to what any member of Congress wants. So again, there's far different uh, interests and far different incentives in Congress where you have a unified incentive in the executive branch. So I would emphasize again, the importance is to, to draw some independence from the executive branch in the Federal Reserve rather than from Congress. So just in summary, the way I understand that is uh, when they talk about independence, they're really not talking about independence. They want to eliminate uh, the role of the Congress, which uh, you're arguing has a responsibility. So they want to be excluded from that supervision, but they don't want to be independent uh, from the Treasury. What about political or private interest influence? I mean, uh, when the bailouts came, there had to have been some special interest and political interest uh, would, would that, uh, uh, could that be said to be not independent either, but influenced by not only the Treasury, but outside interests? Uh, do you think there's much, should there be concern about that? I, I think there's a very absolutely strong concern about that, you know, on several levels. I mean, one could just look at monetary policy, where monetary policy is conducted in partnership with the Federal Reserve's primary dealers in which it buys and sells Treasury securities with to conduct its monetary policy. Well, of course, if you're doing bank supervision, you've got a financial crisis, and these primary dealers find themselves in trouble, the Federal Reserve has an incentive to try to essentially make sure that those primary dealers survive. Uh, and of course, it doesn't want to make any of that public. Uh, I would sure you could ask any of the largest firms that were assisted, whether it was a Goldman or whether it was Society General, they have not welcomed the attention that they've gotten when all of this information has come out. You know, we heard a little bit earlier about the GAO report. One of the things that struck me is if you look through the tables and you look through the information of the GAO report, regardless of the program, it's the same companies that keep repeatedly coming up. You know, repeatedly we see Citi, repeatedly we see Bank of America, repeatedly we say Morgan Stanley. Regardless of the program, it seems to be that the concentration of the benefits of these programs are with a handful of corporations. And of course, those corporations, I think, would not do not want the public attention, but they have repeatedly received incredible assistance from the Federal Reserve, incredible assistance that's been off budget. So again, that relationship and that revolving door, we've seen it. And again, you know, this is something that was talked about in Dodd-Frank, some of the governance issues. You know, we all remember very much the, the role of uh, Goldman essentially being the, the chair of the board at the New York Fed and some of the conflict of interest there. And certainly goes worth saying that the current president of the New York Fed is a former Goldman employee. So not only am I uh, concerned about the revolving door between Treasury and the Fed, I'm also very concerned about the revolving door between Wall Street and the Fed. Thank you. Uh, I yield five minutes to Mr. Lukemeyer from Missouri. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Arbach, <clears throat> in your testimony, you uh, mentioned two or three things here. The LA Fed, whenever there was some corruption that was exposed and some folks stole some money, 
uh, the Federal Airplane or the Federal Reserve Airplane Fleet. Um, the audits that are being performed or would should be performed, uh, would they have caught these abuses? Uh, uh, did the audits have abuses? I, I no, did the audit, <clears throat> with the audits that are being proposed, in other words, uh, right now we've got the, uh, uh, well, the oh. Inspector General folks here at GAO were here a minute ago and they were they're now exp you know, doing an audit on the emergency loan program that was, yeah. that was administered. Uh, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't touch any of these They don't abuses. touch any of these things. They'll say, and that's you're, a, you're, you're saying we should expand the existing audit procedures because existing audit procedures are not catching these things? R definitely. The, there's tremendous problems inside the Fed, and the in-house audits were no good at the Boston Fed. The, uh, the courageous people there that testified right here about it uh, said that someone came up from from upstairs at the Boston Fed near the harbor, the officials of the Fed are at the top, people that run the airplane fleet were down below, and somebody came down, is everything all right here? That was about the extent of the in-house audit. <clears throat> and uh, there were all kinds of corruptions, and uh, so many corruptions that uh, uh, Henry Gonzalez, uh, the chairman, uh, asked, the, uh, asked me to call the Janet Reno uh, Justice Department, which I did, and they didn't want to get into it. Nobody likes to attack the Fed in Washington. So I, they said, call, call the Inspector General of the Fed, which I did, very nice man, Brent Bowen. And uh, he said, well, I don't know if I have jurisdiction up in Boston. And that's one of the major problems of the Fed and this new Consumer, uh, consumer agency that's located, consumer protection agency located inside the Fed. The IG of the Federal Reserve is appointed by the head of the Federal Reserve. So how can he investigate these things? Bernanke it cannot be investigated and his uh, officials by the person they appoint. This should be a presidential appointment and an independent IG at the Fed if you want to start cleaning up this mess. Do you think there's anything that should be off limits whenever it comes to disclosure of the Fed activities? Um, that's a very interesting question because um, the, the Fed is now shredding their uh, documents, but Arthur Burns, who was the head of the Fed back in the 70s, he died in uh, 1987 and he sent his his transcripts of the meetings up to uh, the University of Michigan, the Ford Library. And they had uh, people from the National, National Archivists, professional archivists, took out anything that had to do with national security, personnel. They were lightly edited. So I was able to go up there and get copies of them all. They're very different than the kind of thing that the Fed issues. Ask any reporter that's received something from the Fed. It's mostly blanked out. Redacted. That was a much better record. <clears throat> and what should be done now is that the Fed should be told, you cannot destroy those records. They go to the National Archives after 30 years. There'll be somebody looking at that. And also, on these FOIA requests, you should get professional archivists that know the rules in cooperation with the Fed instead of sending reporters blank pages. Okay, Dr. Klebby, what do you think about that? Is there, are there some things that you believe they should, they should not be uh, disclosed or off limits, or you think everything is open to everything? I, I think the way I would look at it is the question of when should it be disclosed. Ultimately, any sort of deliberations, any sort of economic forecasts, should be disclosed at some point. Uh, I would be comfortable having some sort of time lag. For instance, uh, one of the things that Dodd-Frank does, and I think does correctly, uh, despite that much of what the bill doesn't do correctly, is require a disclosure of future discount window lending. And so the concern from the Federal Reserve would be if you disclose at the time that banks are coming to the discount window, that is a signal that such banks are weak. Um, and 
I think that's a legitimate concern to raise. Uh, but I think if you, and again, in Dodd-Frank, it allows up to two year delay for that disclosure. I would prefer something closer to a year, but I do, I would say a six month, a year delay on something like discount window is legitimate in that it will not scare away people from using the discount window. Of course, we can have exception, a, a, a totally separate discussion of whether there should be a lender of last resort in a discount window. But again, if you're going to have one and you want it to be effective, a delay of disclosure in that I think is reasonable. Uh, a delay of disclosure on deliber deliber deliberations at the Federal Open Market Committee meetings I think are, again, reasonable. Ultimately, in a timely basis, all of this information should be made public. And I want to emphasize, you know, five, 10 years is not timely. You know, right. So again, we need to get out in a reasonable amount of time. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank the gentleman. And we'll go into a second series of questioning. Uh, this question is for Dr. Arbach and uh, has to do with uh, what you talked about uh, when you were trying to get an audit in the 70s and uh, you didn't get too far in the banking committee, even though it was the chairman of the banking committee that wanted to do it. And then they took it and they sent it over to the government operations committee. And then when they, you know, gave the authority for the audit, it was, you know, actually exactly the opposite and, and closed that. I wanted you to expand on that. And also, why don't you tell me why it is that the individuals either in the Fed or see to it that their people get in the Fed, how, how come they have this much power that they have, <laughs> that they're able to, to control even the banking committee chairman and then, and then pass legislation, uh, you know, exactly opposite of it? And I, I think it was at that time that they really put into it to, it seems like where the greatest protection is on these uh, uh, foreign operations. I think that's where a lot, there's a lot of mischief. And even now with our partial audit, we right. hear about it, but we don't know exactly what transpired. Could you expand on that a little bit? Sure. L let me take the second part first on international operations. Um, you, uh, you were right about the, the bill that was finally passed where the GAO is not allowed to go into anything that has to do with the operations, international operations or monetary policy, trophies that remained on the shelf of the Fed for a long time. In international operations, when the Fed goes, uh, for instance, and notifies brokers all over the world, brokers who are not, uh, they are not uh, investigated by anybody in the United States, and uh, tells them we want to buy, say, five billion in euros. Uh, that information is given to the brokers ahead of time. And there's ever, I'm not saying the brokers are dishonest, but you know when there's billions at stake in these markets, they can place orders or people in their office can place orders long before the order is consummated. So we wrote, uh, the chairman wrote to Alan Greenspan and said, why are you doing this? Why not just make an announcement that you're going in with five billion and let everybody in the market get in on it at the same time? And he, he wrote back, well, I think there's only about a 10 minute delay between the time we tell them to do it and they buy these huge, make these huge purchases. Well, that's ample enough to make a lot of money in the market. And so, the international operations should be audited by the GAO. It's a really important, and I think they should, when the Fed is going to do something, they should announce it. And I disagree a little bit with Dr. Calabria. I would not leave these decisions for discount rate changes and for um, uh, and anything the Federal Open Market Committee does for more than six months, even that is very long because there have been so many leaks at the Fed. The FBI has been called in, all the rest. It's going to leak out anyway. There are several ways it leaks out. One is when we ask how many people at the Fed know about these secret interest rate decisions, we got a whole bunch of pages, single-spaced, of hundreds of people all over the country on these conference calls. and. Uh, as, as Greenspan reported, he was saying he opens the Singapore edition of the Wall Street Journal and found out what the Fed did at their meetings before. 
So you can't tie up information that's so valuable for months and that just benefits uh, inside traders. And uh, those trophies, when they did go over and put them in there, it kept the GAO out of a lot of, lot of the problems. And can I say one other thing uh, that I think is important? Um, uh, we have sitting in the audience Walter Charlton, who's uh, had suits against the GAO since 1983 uh, because the GAO has had a policy, alleged policy, of, I had excellent people that were at the Los Angeles Fed that did the audits. They were excellent. They were old timers at the Fed that knew how a central bank works and knew what to get into and what to look at. Uh, the, the suits now in the courts all these years, uh, some of them have been adjudicated. Some of the people that, the, the suits allege they try to get rid of the older people. Uh, in a recent suit, I gather that after a joint session of Congress, 200 were rehired by the GAO. Um, but they, they try to get rid of the old people, people that are 55 or older around there, and hire young people. And I, can, I know they hire young people because I used to have lunch with David Walker when he came to the LBJ school to get some of our excellent young students. But that lowers the amount they have to pay the people by a huge amount. But what we need in the GAO are experienced auditors that know how central banks work and can get in there and really find out what's going on. That takes a lot of training to find out how do you do a vault facility. The vault facility, since we found the, that uh, team that was in there that I worked with was excellent. And they found out what was missing. And it was just awful. The, the main ledger of the vault on a computer, everybody could get in there without a password. What happened to those officials when that thing went public? Nothing has happened since then at the Fed. And I think it's very important to get better GAO auditors. Now, maybe they have them that are experienced in how to audit a huge, enormous central bank with 20,000 employees. And they have vaults all over the country that hold all the money for the commercial banks and the Bureau of Engraving ships it there, all the new money's in there also. It's a national security problem, and if Greenspan thought the employees were stealing $500,000 in 10 years, we thought that was a tremendous understatement, given the, and so did that Fed, uh, the, the GAO crew, but I don't believe shortly thereafter most of them were no longer at the GAO. Thank you. Uh, I yield five minutes to Mr. Lukamara. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a feeling that both you gentlemen have got a lot more to say and a lot more suggestions for us, so I think I'll just use my time a little differently this time. Um, uh, Dr. Calabria, what regula you are the Director of Financial Regulatory Studies. Uh, what one regulation would you suggest that we as a Congress, as a committee start out with, or as Congress, you know, try and uh, put together that would be impactful? Is it you know, audit the full Fed, or are there something else that you see that could really, you know, protect our monetary system and uh, really make an impact? What, what would be your suggestion? Well, I think the focus really needs to be on defining and limiting the discretion for the Fed on price stability. So, I mean, again, you could do things like reduce, you know, eliminate the dual mandate, you know, having some sort of inflation targeting. I would emphasize that ultimately what's going to be a constraint on the Fed is some sort of competition. So obviously encouraging alternative monetary mechanisms is something we should be looking at in the long run, but certainly trying to find a way to constrain the Fed. So I'd have a full audit. I would get rid of the dual mandate. Uh, I would put some statutory flesh around what exactly price stability means. Uh, because again, you could get rid of the dual mandate, but if the Fed decides that price stability is three or four percent, then it then it doesn't really matter. You have to take some of these definitions back into Congress. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize you know, one of the reasons I think that the Federal Reserve has been so effective over the years at thwarting Congress is that they come up here and they give you all this gobbledygook about you know M1, M2, and all this, and they try to confuse you. And again, the most important thing is to get information out there so that members of Congress 
can even start with the very right questions and, and, and can push them, you know, and, and basically not let them get around that. So, you know, most important thing we can do is to educate Congress and public on how exactly monetary policy works. Very good. Asked for one and got three. Must be D.C. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Harbach, uh, with regards to uh, the same question, uh, you, you've had a lot of advice for us in some of your previous uh, comments here. What, what piece of advice or regulation would you suggest? Uh, well, price stability is certainly important, but the Fed should understand uh, it's the 1949 Employment Act that said they have to do uh, full employment also, that price stability helps produce full employment. And uh, right now, we have, we have quite a bit of inflation. Year over year, one month it was 4%, then 5%. Then Bernanke testified that he doesn't see any inflation. How high does it have to go before he sees it? That's year over year inflation. And the other thing that I think uh, the Congress should have something to say about is what I call malpractice at the Fed. In in September, in September 2008, when Lehman Brothers collapsed and the markets went crazy all over the world, one month later, the Fed decided that they'd start paying the banks interest in order that for them to hold their reserves. Do, I've, I have that diagram, I wonder if you put it up, of the amount of, uh, there it is there, the amount of excess reserve. You'll notice that since the beginning, this is the Federal Reserve of St. Louis, it's zero. All of a sudden in 210, the uh, banks, you know, they're, they're intelligent. They say, look, we can get a quarter percent interest risk-free from the Fed. Why should we loan it to businesses? So the Fed began pumping in their monetary base. They pumped in one point nine trillion. How much of that got out for loans to banks and, and uh, to businesses? 1.7 trillion was parked as excess reserves is there today. Uh, out of that, the, the total today is 1.6 trillion in excess reserve, excuse me, 1.6 trillion. It went through the roof. Now we're in a position today where People inside the Fed, economists inside the Fed, like William Gavin, a great economist at the St. Louis Fed, published in their literature, for the banks, it's a much better investment to hold the money as excess reserves, tie it up, than to lend it out to people. Because they get a quarter percent for sure. We're in a terrible environment. What should be done immediately, I call this malpractice that certainly increased unemployment in the United States. The Fed must stop paying the banks to hold reserves instead of lending it to businesses. And if they do that, they've got to be very careful that the money supply doesn't balloon out or we'll have a huge inflation. They will have to slightly raise their target interest rate to about a half percent. They should be doing that. They've been at zero long enough, and you can see what good that has done for the country. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. I have uh, one more question for, for the two of you. We, we talk about the transparency and how to get information out and how dangerous it is if somebody gets the information and they can make some money on it uh, because the, the mar they anticipate what the market will do. And also, the, there's so often the unintended consequences of uh, manipulating uh, what they do, the economic consequences. And we talk and discuss, and there was a slight disagreement on exactly when we release information, uh, when did the Fed do this, and when do we get a record of the history. My question is a little bit different. It has actually to do with monetary policy per se, not how we tell the, how the Fed manages monetary policy. From my viewpoint, see, they've had two mandates, uh, full employment, and I don't think either one of you sort of enjoy that. Employment, you know, if you really look at the old-fashioned way of measuring, it's probably over 20 percent. And then Dr. Arbach admitted that uh, price stability, they're, they're not doing very well there. Uh, but it, but it, I, I sort of got the uh, indication from both of you that 
it wasn't the principle of setting the interest rates, it's, it's how they do it and when it's released and, and the details of it. But what about the, the question of whether or not they should be messing around with interest rates? You know, most, most economists um, these days, ever since the 70s, they sort of have uh, played down wage and price controls. Wage and price controls aren't very good as a solution to, to uh, solve the problem of uh, price inflation created by uh, too much money. Uh, but uh, setting interest rates is a pretty big deal. I mean, if, if interest rate, if prices are the signal that tells the businessman what to do and the consumer what to do, the supply and demand, and uh, of course, uh, free market economists predicted that socialism would absolutely fail without a pricing structure. But why is it that we've accepted this idea that the Fed is all knowing with their record? So could you each tell me that, um, do you think it would be bad to have a system where the Fed wasn't involved with sin setting interest rates and maybe market rates would help? Maybe market rates would help, help savings. You know, maybe interest rates would go up and the people who, who tend not to want to gamble in the stock market and the bond market, uh, wouldn't this be a help to economy? Uh, could both of you just make a comment about uh, whether or not the Fed should be setting interest rates? Well, I think that's a really good question. And in 1979, uh, we had a little uh, uh, party right here in this room, and the new chairman was coming on board. Uh, he was a very good chairman, Volcker. Uh, and at that time, by 1980, the inflation in the United States was going over 13%. Interest rates went up over 20%. There were mass bankruptcies in the country. And uh, Volcker was laughing with us and said to two of us from the University of Chicago, you give me a pain in my you-know-what. And we laughed together. But then Volcker decided he wouldn't control interest rates. He would control the money supply and stop printing so much money, which he did. He paid a big price, but he stopped the country from going into a terrible inflation. We had a double dip. I was in the Reagan administration, and we had a double dip uh, recession, 10% unemployed. But then we had a long period of uh, no inflation. So he did a great job. We paid a terrible price. Uh, but when Alan Greenspan came in, the idea of controlling the money supply was considered, oh, that's University of Chicago monetarists, and they don't know what they're doing. So by the end of the 1980s, he decided the Fed would no longer target money. He would do what other central banks do, just target the interest rates. It's, and uh, I think they should do both. They should watch the money supply, but they should do what Congressman Paul said, try to let the interest rates go to market interest rates instead of sitting on them. Uh, I would start by saying that uh, I believe there's probably no more important price in the economy than the interest rate. I mean, you really do balance savings investment, and you balance time preferences. Uh, and accordingly, when we get that wrong, we get a whole lot wrong, and you can have all sorts of disruptions to the economy. So ultimately, the answer should be a very strong no. We should not have the Fed be manipulating what is the most important price in the economy. I thank the panel for uh, appearing, and uh, this committee is now adjourned. <clears throat> <clears throat>